And now, it's The Law Show on CL 650. A comprehensive look at everything you need to know about the law. Now, here's Sterling Fox. Good morning and welcome to The Law Show here on Sea Isle 650. Today we're talking with our friends from Murphy Batista, uh, personal injury lawyers in Vancouver. We're going to talk about ICBC and uh, insurance for drivers in British Columbia. But first, let me introduce our guests in studio. Always a pleasure to welcome Joe Murphy to the program. Uh, Joe uh, is a QC lawyer and partner with Murphy Batista in Vancouver. Nice to see you again, Joe. Good morning, Sterling. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's good to have you back with us. And also rejoining us in studio from Murphy Batista is Angela Price Stevens, who is an associate with the firm uh, with a focus, shall we say, on medical malpractice. Nice to see you again. And nice to see you again. But but the the focus isn't only mal- medical malpractice. Uh, Murphy Batista is a personal injury law firm, Angela. So your work crosses over from you. It's not just a single uh, effort that you no, do. No, my my work crosses over, um, and it crosses over very nicely. Between particularly with the more catastrophic injuries, Mm -hmm. yes. Joe, you're a QC. Explain to our law show audience exactly what that designation, Queen's Counsel, means and how long have you had it? Sterling, the designation began in England, and if you wanted to be a lawyer for the king or queen, you had to be designated either King's Counsel or Queen's Counsel. Okay. Um, that, That system was imported to Canada and was given to lawyers who were... Uh, leaders in the profession who did a lot of trial work, a lot of community work. Um, There is about 20 given out each uh, year in British Columbia. The other provinces are very similar, and I got mine in 1999, which is 15 years ago. Okay. And uh, who was the, no, does this, is an appointment by, is it the attorney general who makes the designation? Is it the lieutenant governor? Who's responsible for the, for uh, actually appointing you uh, this designation? The attorney general gives out the QCs. Okay. The decisions made by a committee of the attorney general, the chief justices of the three levels of court, and two other people. Oh, so, so it's a matter of many are nominated, but few are chosen each year. Interesting stuff. Angela, do they still have QCs in the UK, I oh, assume? Oh, yes, very much so. In fact, uh, over there, if you're not a QC, uh, you are referred to as junior counsel. If you're, if you're a barrister, I mean, there, it's, 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 there are other significant differences. Over there, you follow the track of solicitor or barrister. But from a barrister's perspective, those who spend a lot of time in court, you are a QC mm-hmm. or you are a junior. And it doesn't matter whether you're 25 or 55. If you have not reached QC status, you are still considered junior. Interesting yes. stuff. Wow. Uh, Murphy Batista, you and Joe Batista, Mr. Murphy, established this firm uh, right from the get-go as a personal injury law firm. It was a quite a small operation back in the 80s. It has evolved into quite, uh, quite the company. Tell us about about the history of Murphy Batista? Uh, Sterling, the firm was established, and when I use that word, one has a sense of something big, and it wasn't. It was something very little. January of 1982, I remember the time well because the interest rates were 19%, and businesses were closing, they weren't opening, mm. and we uh, moved into an office where we rented two little offices and two secretarial bays. And hence the firm began with two lawyers and two what was then called secretaries. Right, right. Uh, We now have 15 lawyers and a support staff of about 50. And we have a floor in one of the large office towers downtown. So it's a big change. uh, Rather, uh, but I I, I can understand remembering those hideous interest rates because, of course, two guys and uh, two assistants trying to start a new business, you would have had to float a loan of some kind, and so that would be a pretty memorable interest rate to start off in business at. Would it, you, it, it's tough to forget a number like that, isn't it? Well, it was, and I, I, I also remember the bank being very leery about loaning money to uh, any new business, particularly a business that looked as if it didn't have much in the way of of clients. We didn't. We don't have big clients. Mm-hmm. We We have clients who have been injured some some um, fairly small modest injuries where they recover and others with catastrophic injuries so on paper the firm at that time looked as if it really didn't have much if any value right and banks hate loaning money to companies that have little or no value interesting stuff why did you pick personal injury why did you and Joe Batista take that uh, chart that course right from the beginning um, 
I, I th my answer, Sterling, is sort of multifaceted. My father, who died a few years ago at age 96, was a radiologist. My mother, uh, until she started having children and she had eight of them, was a nursing instructor. So I grew up at the dinner table hearing stories about what was going on at a hospital or my father's office, and my parents would discuss it. So I always had that interest. When I, when I was a kid, I used to go with my father to the hospital. Uh, he worked at a hospital on Saturdays, and I would go with him, and my reward was a, an orange crush pop. And ah. I would sit there and watch him read the films, and he would point out things to me. Um, and then the, the next big factor is when I was going through law school, I, was, I worked part-time as an insurance adjuster. And this was for a company that was phasing out because ICBC was coming in. Okay, sure. And I worked five hours a day on average, 25 hours a week as an adjuster and learned far more at that job than I did sitting in a law school class. I believe that too. And that was dealing with insurance claims, right. a variety, but of course a number of, of um, motor vehicle injury claims. So that's what sort of led me into that area. And by the time 1982 rolled around, that was the majority of my practice. And that's evolved into uh, our our practice, injury and insurance claims. Right. And Angela, when you uh, were a, a lawyer in the UK, you visited Vancouver as a tourist. I did. And, and nice. you decided, wow, what a fantastic place to live. Gee, I'd like to come back here and, and live and work and, and have a life here. And so you went back to the UK and began plotting. <laughs> and many years later, here you are. So tell us what happened, how the plot was hatched, and clearly it worked. Oh, yes. I um, I basically came over here in 94 and just fell in love with the place. Um, so it was a magical summer. Um, and I knew when I left, I made a promise to myself that I would be back. I uh, made a couple of other promises that were details in that in that fairy tale picture, and yes, they've all come to fruition. Um, I have been very fortunate, and I'm very lucky. But as my father has always said, he says it's it's funny, Ange, but the harder I work, the luckier I become. Mm -hmm. And so that was instilled in me from a very young age. And uh, I spent my life wanting my cake and eating it. <laughs> right. And so I, yeah, I was determined to come back. Um, it, it's just strange that in 94, I was, I, I still actually hadn't uh, qualified as a lawyer at that point. Okay, so you were, here okay. I was going, still going through the sure, process. Right, right. And so when I fell in love with Vancouver and I vowed I would be back and work downtown as a lawyer, um, I wasn't even a lawyer in the UK at that point. Right. I, I was just so enamored by Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Um, that I have uh, had a number of friends say, but Ange, why are you doing this? You're throwing everything away you've worked for. And I would look at them and say, you're crazy. Right, this right. is what I want. That's right. So why would I give that up without a fight? Right. And so, um, uh, yeah, and I stalked Joe. I stalked Joe Murphy and Joe Batista for right. a number of years. From from a safe distance? Uh, from from afar, yes, from the UK. <laughs> I, I had been uh, Googling and I had been uh, checking out websites. And um, so I knew, I knew where I wanted to be. And um, yeah, I, I came over here in early 2006. And uh, I was very, f again, very fortunate that that year, the Trial Lawyers Association, um, the, well, it's now the American Association of Justice, or American... Uh, AAJ. AAJ, American Association of Justice. Right. Um, as it's known now, they had their um, annual summer conference in Seattle. Now, in other years, it could be, you know, across the states. This year, or this particular year, 2006. Just down the road. It just happened to be down the road. Right. So that was it. I was straight there within three months of landing as a new immigrant. Um, and I found Joe with a glass of wine in his hand, and I impressed upon him that I wanted to be uh, with Murphy Batista, and, and Joe gave me the opportunity. And what, what uh, because your, your focus, your, your area of perhaps specialization, even though that's a dodgy word, um, you, you do focus a great deal of your professional time and energy on medical malpractice. What on earth drew you to that category? Well, I had a number of, shall we say, lucky breaks in my career. Again, it's the work ethic. It's the combination of getting on 
always having got on really well with who I'm working for at the time as a as a junior lawyer in the UK and uh, m manipulating a situation that I can actually get into the area that I was most interested in and it's because really that the, the, the different experiences that I had it was in the early years it was more professional uh, professional malpractice on the defense side so I would represent um, the police, various police constabularies when people brought oh, civil claims, okay, sure, maybe right. death in custody, right. uh, false imprisonment, etc. And then o other lawyers who had allegedly screwed up. And believe me, that does happen. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about that in the uh, context of ICBC in a few minutes. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, the first 10 years of my career was pretty much defense. But it, again, it, the, the general theme was that it was professional malpractice. And inherently, these cases tend to be far more complex. And, and this is why I say that it was a lucky break, because as a junior lawyer, I... I was I was very lucky to be paired off with a partner who was doing that kind of work. Now, part of it was luck and part of it was manipulation and mm. part of it was me saying, I want to work for Adrian Oliver, who does the police work, and right. get out of my way. Um, and then you threw yourself into oh, it. Oh, I totally threw right. myself right. into it and loved it. And uh, it, it was a case of work hard, play hard. So we would work very hard on this the next big police case. Um, and when we were successful, we went out and we celebrated. And it was, it was yeah, it, it, it really cemented that work ethic for me, uh, which, you know, I'd grown up with. My father's a businessman. Mm -hmm. I can't expect either the Joes, Murphy or Batista, wanting anyone around who wasn't prepared to roll up their sleeves well, and work very <laughs> hard <laughs> every day. This is true. I doubt that I would have lasted eight years with Murphy Batista if I couldn't roll up my sleeves and get on with it. Joe, this is the law show, and Angela used a couple of terms that we're familiar with in Canada, but you use them in the context of British uh, lawyers, practicing lawyers. Are you, sir, a barrister, a solicitor, or both? Well, actually, Sterling, in British Columbia, uh, my title is barrister and solicitor because that's a, that's one description. That's what we usually see in, on a lawyer's sign. In too. some jurisdictions, like England, you're either a solicitor or you're a barrister. And not only is there the division in a name, but you have different offices. Mm -hmm. uh, here it's blended. Um, I think the blending is the better way to go, but I've never worked in the other system. So I, I, I can only uh, look at it from having been here where we do one thing. So if I was in England and I got hired by a client who was injured, I would do all the work on the file until it was going to court, and then I would, I, I would get in a taxi and I would ride over to the uh, barrister's office and I would hand him or her the file, and they would go to trial. Because a solicitor isn't allowed to go to trial in, in Britain, it's just not their function. Interesting. Okay, so Canadian, because we see that on, you know, you'd see an ad in the paper or whatever, John Q. Smith. Barrister and solicitor. So that's the way we resolve it in Canada. All lawyers are both. Yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Um, but there are lawyers in the Canadian system, Angela, who never have been to court and most likely in their professional careers never will go to court. And that's by design. They're not interested. Well, that's true. Um, when you're talking about lawyers generally, though, I think we need to recognize that there are certain types of lawyer who do tend towards the solicitor function. Sure, and sure. so it's really not in their remit to go to court. They right. may be specializing in an area or focusing in an area that uh, would not require them to go to court. However, um, the individuals within the profession that you need to be cautious of are those who hold themselves out to be barristers, although that term is not terribly you know, frequently used here, it, it tends to be more lawyer or trial lawyers, those that um, profess to be trial lawyers who are also shy of going to court. That's, right. that's, that's an anomaly. That that's that, that's, that's, it even sounds weird. I'm a trial well, lawyer, but I don't like to go to court. So why do you call yourself a trial lawyer in the first place if you never go to trial? Joe, uh, do you, you must know people like this. Well, uh, Sterling, there's a number of people who do injury cases who hold themselves out to their clients as being strong, aggressive trial lawyers who rarely or never go to court. 
The clients don't understand that, but the insurance company is very aware of that. Okay. And it puts the client at a disadvantage because while most cases settle, an insurance company who knows a lawyer will never go to court is not going to pay the same amount as if they know that if the amount isn't enough, there's going to be a trial. So it's the expression I use, it's like having a gunslinger, but he doesn't have any bullets. That's right. That's right. So great costume, but uh, not much help in a pinch, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, we need to take a quick break here, and we're going to focus on, uh, for the balance of this program, about when and how someone should hire a lawyer for something simple, like an ICBC claim. This happens to all of us in our driving lifetimes here in British Columbia. Still okay to some of us more than once, but at least once in our lifetime. And our guests insist a lawyer's advice under any circumstances involving ICBC is a really smart You don't have to hire one, but you should talk to one. So we'll talk with our guests about when, who, and how to have those conversations. Our guests, Joe Murphy, QC, lawyer and partner with Murphy Batista, joined in studio by Angela Price-Stevens with Murphy Batista and medical malpractice, among many other functions at the firm. I'm Sterling Fox. This is The Law Show. Nice to have you with us. We'll be right back. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL 650.